So last May, I was preparing to go into the field in Arctic Alaska. And so for many years, my research team has been going out into this cold place in May to look at the fish and understand how they move out of the lakes in spring, move out into the streams to breed and to feed uh, during the short Alaskan summer. And so we had, we had gone at, into Fairbanks. We drove up on our 4 by 4 It takes about a day to get up to the North Slope from there. Came over the mountains, and what we saw was not the cold winter scene we expected, which we really needed to perform our research, because what we do is we, we get out there when there's still snow on the ground. We use snow machines to get all our heavy equipment out to remote field camps. And we also sit there waiting for the fish to come out of the lake so we can catch them, tag them, understand what they do in, in the summer. And usually we're there in those remote camps just waiting, drinking coffee, um, waiting for the fish to come out. Uh, but when we arrived last May, we came over those mountains and we stared across that coastal plain going out to the, to, to the Arctic Ocean. And, and instead what we saw was not the, the snow, the white that we expected. What we saw was this landscape that was already green with spring. So Arctic spring had sprung a month early. And the fish that we were trying to study had already left the lakes to go into the stream. We couldn't use snow machines to get our heavy equipment out to our field camps anymore. In fact, we had to have helicopters bringing our supplies. And, and yes, this is one of my field team wearing a t-shirt in the Arctic. It should have been winter yet, and it was already into summer. And throughout the Arctic, you go, go anywhere and you see these holes opening up in what used to be permafrost and now is not. And so this ages-old permafrost is melting, creating these, these thermocrusts, these holes, this cliff going into, into lakes just melting. And you walk up to one and, and you just hear all of that ice that's been there for a long time melting, dripping. And hear the clatter of stones that are, are falling out of that ice that, that had been there since the last ice age. It looks to me, when you see these areas, that the Arctic has just given up to the people. And it really is. And the problem with our fish now is that they go out into these streams. And then come, come late fall, they need to get back into the lakes to survive because the, the streams will freeze solid. And normally there's, there's enough water in those streams to allow them to come back into the lakes. But as temperatures are warming in the summer, strange things are happening in the Arctic. So the water levels now drop. And so those fish get trapped almost every year now as they try to make it back into the, into the lake. And once they're trapped in a small little pool, it just takes a day or two for the birds and the bears to eat a captive piece. And so these, these changes are happening throughout the Arctic, and really throughout the world. This is just, these are just one example of many examples throughout the world of, of how things are changing drastically. In this past year, we reached a degree Celsius change in the Earth's temperature. And so no matter how you measure it, the temperatures have risen now one degree Celsius. And when we got out onto that Arctic plain, what we were experiencing was the future, because it was the hottest, 2015 was the hottest year on record. It took us 165 years of pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to reach this threshold of one degree Celsius. And even with the promises in Paris, it will only take us 30 years to add another degree Celsius to the Earth's temperature. So we're looking at two degrees Celsius in just 30 years. So welcome to the heat age. And many of you have lived your entire lives in the heat age. So if you were born after 1985, every month in the world has been hotter than average. So you spent your entire life in the heat age, whether you realize it or not. And we still have a long time to go, probably 100 years, even if we start to try to control emissions right now. We will live through this heat age. 
And there are a lot of effects of this heat age. So direct effects of sea level rise, stronger storms, droughts that affect humans directly. But there are other effects on nature, on biodiversity. And some of those effects can have even greater effects on humans through disease, crop failures, things like that. So these are the, are the real unknowns that we have to face. And, and we need to be able to get through the heat age and protect these ecosystems and that biodiversity as much as we can. As humans, you know, we, we're going to build seawalls. Um, you know, we can do things to moderate our ability to survive the heat age. But many species out there cannot. So when it gets a little warmer, we can take off our sweater. If it gets even warmer, we can turn on the air conditioner. But the species in nature can't do that. So take, for example, this pika. It's a, it's a small rabbit-like creature. It lives in the, in the mountains in western North America. It lives on these mountain peaks. And this species is adapted to live in these really extreme, cold, mountaintop environments. However, as the temperatures are rising, this species is increasingly at threat of extinction. Because it can't move off the mountaintop. It goes into the warm valleys. It can't withstand that heat. Even when it gets into the 60s, this animal can't shed its fur coat. And it starts to, to face serious problems. If it gets a little hotter, it, it dies. So nature is, is, is very sensitive to these changes. And not only individual species, but an entire ecosystem. So this is a, a, a marble salamander. It's a, a species that lives through winter in ponds. And, and normally, it can't survive in a lot of ponds because the ice forms over and there's no more oxygen left. But as temperatures are warming, this species is able to, to now survive throughout the winter, throughout, throughout this entire region. And you'll notice, you know, one thing you'll notice is, is not just you have this, this salamander in here, but also how green it is. Look at that green. It reminds me of the green when it was cut out into the Arctic. This is because not only can, can the, the algae now in that water grow over winter, but this predator eats all the herbivores. So these species are very sensitive to small changes in climate. And they can magnify those effects across the entire ecosystem to completely change it. A few years ago, you go into this pond, and it would be com completely clear that as this predator has gained a foothold, it changed the entire food web. And I've looked across all the information out there to understand the risks of climate change for extinction. And I've assembled it into this graph. So, so basically what this shows is that the more the Earth warms, there's this accelerating risk of extinction throughout the world. This is based on the current information we have. And so at current, about 3% of species on Earth are endangered. If we get to the target of 2 degrees Celsius, which we hope we can do, it looks increasingly difficult. Look at about 5% of species, 1 in 20, are at risk. And if we continue on our, on our current trajectory of emissions, we will get to 16% of species in the world at risk of extinction. What that means is you go outside today and you look and you count six different species, and one of those could be at risk of disappearing. And so this is the best information we have right now. This is hundreds of studies that have been done. But unfortunately, it's not our best understanding. So we need to make these predictions to understand which of those species are at risk so we can protect them. But I'm saying that that information is not so good because we've got hundreds of years of, of information about biology and how things react to the environment, and that's not in those models. These are basic models that, that are used in statistics to extrapolate, to do all those things that we say you're not really supposed to do. You're supposed to understand causation, right? And so these models are excluding the realistic movement of those species. So they are assuming that species can, can generally move the same. But we know that, for example, that pika does not have the capacity to move very far, whereas something like a wolf can move great distances and, and, and move with the climate. These models are excluding species interaction. So think back to that salamander larva and its huge impacts on other species in the ecosystem. Almost all those models neglect this key feature And then almost all of the models exclude evolution. Right? And, and evolution is the real bright spot here. I mean, they could save many species if they can adapt to these new climates. And yet again, it's not in our current understanding. 
So what this, this means is that we, we need to develop these, these predictive abilities to predict which species are at risk. Just like weather forecasts have improved with really good positive mechanistic models that now can predict the weather uh, far in advance with great accuracy. And, and we can do this. We can build these models. We have the skills to do that. Um, you know, this is just a screenshot from, from one of the models that I built showing you uh, distributions of species moving across space in response to climate change. Some can move faster, some can, can uh, only move to a certain degree, and, and we can look at those effects in these models. You know, as much as we can build realistic video games, right, increasingly so realistic, we, we can build these models for species and, and, and see how they respond to climate change. But, but there's one problem, and that's that we almost always lack the information to put in those models. We know so little about the world and its, and its, and its species. You know, there are, there are some species of economic concern. We, we, we know all these pieces of information, like their, their ability to evolve, their, their interaction with other species. But almost all species on Earth, we lack critical information to put into these, these great models that we can build. So, so you know, the problem right now is, is not anything to do with our, our ability to, to predict or ability to build better models. It's that we, we don't have information on, these, on the species around the world, millions of species. And so you know, my challenge for you is, is in our world is to develop an effort, not unlike that which was used to, to predict climate change in the first place. This was an effort that took people that were in climate science around the world. Thousands of people came together to build really good models of climate change and, and develop uh, the information needed to go into those models. And for that, that there was the Nobel Peace Prize that was, was uh, given to us. We need a similar effort to predict the effects of climate change now on the natural environment. And a lot of this is going to get down to what I call boots, binoculars, and beakers. We need to get out there and figure out how those fish move across the landscape. Figure out how climate will, will alter the distribution of the species, alter the interactions among species. And this is a hard thing. But we can do it. We can get out there. We can measure these important pieces of information, put them in the models, and really understand what is at risk, what we could lose if we don't start now to preserve those parts of our ecosystem. And biodiversity provides lots of benefits to humans. It provides us with medicines. It provides us with new technologies. Nature has solved just basically everything out there through adaptation over, over millions of years. And it provides us with all sorts of foods and economic products. But for me, it's not just that. It's because I want my children and my children's children to still have that experience of going out in nature. This is my son experiencing a wood frog for the first time. I, I think we owe it to future generations to try to protect as many species, as many ecosystems as we can during the global heat. We're trying to do that now in the Arctic, so, but everything is changing so quickly, it's hard to even be able to, to do that. So we don't have much time. So this year, my field team has already left to go into the Arctic a full month early. Because this year is even hotter than the last. And so we face this global heat age, and uh, what we need to do to preserve those those few, those, those millions of species out there that are at risk is we need to understand their properties, understand what they do, and in the end, we'll be able to keep those systems intact for future generations.